Welcome to today's uh, farmer meetup. And today it's Trust Me, I'm a Farmer Company. And we've got the lovely James, Lee and John who are going to be talking to us. And it's been a while since our, our last meetup. Uh, what with COVID and whatnot, it's been a bit sort of upside down, but um, delighted to kick it off again. And just so that you know as well, um, so we, we run these uh, every sort of six to eight weeks. Um, and the team that runs this is, is James, myself, Abby and, and Sam. And uh, so if anybody's got any uh, case studies or new tech or any kind of uh, interesting topics, it's really about building the community and sharing um, sort of learnings, then please uh, let us know. We'd love to, to, to host more and more people. Um, and uh, really to just give you a, a little bit of a taster of what Salamandra has been working on um, recently. So we are um, an animation firm um, and we work in B2B uh, and we do a whole stack of different animations. So I just thought it'd be nice to share some visuals while we're on here. And also uh, we're part of the, um, the marketing sale, which, which is with uh, 30 other agencies at the moment we're offering, um, I'm doing a big sale here, 33% off for um, any marketing uh, uh, secured in January. And it's really to help boost sales um, and boost um, the economy. Uh, and it's with the uh, London agency um, and Pimento and 30 other agencies. So that's um, uh, just a little um, sort of heads up really. Uh, I shall stop sharing. Um, and oops. Is very confusing. So anyway, so I just wanted to um, <laughs> introduce our first speaker, who is James um, Harper, and uh, he's here, of course a passionate about the use of digital technologies such as Viva that enhances sales force effectiveness and the relationship between HCPs, um, infield teams, and brand teams. So he's actually a farmer, true blood, with a digital spine. It sounds very Harry Potter. Um, and his, his topic is the state of the nation in pharma and the multi-channel rep. So take it away, James. Thank you very much, Christine. So let me share uh, this and then just shout out if when I press play, what do I get? Do you get my notes or my screen? Uh, notes. Notes, right, bear with me. Swap it over. That should now work. Are you now on yep. the main slide? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. The first thing to say is uh, to, to echo Christine's sentiments. It's great to be back as the MCM um, um, Farmer MCM Meetup. So uh, for those that you don't know, Christine and I, with a couple of other um, partners who who've, who've no longer in the uh, are no longer in the farmer space, set this up in October 2018. Um, this is our 13th meeting, and we've had 650 seats uh, or bums on seats plus today. Um, so, you know, it's, it's as Christine says about building the community. Now, uh, I'm sure anyone with the word digital in their company name or job title has seen nothing but Zoom and been busy since I think it really kicked off for us around April last year. And that's pretty much when these meetings came to a sort of a halt um, because everyone was scrambling um, to pivot. So I, I owe a, a, um, a note of thanks to Christine and Abby because they got the momentum going back on these. It wasn't me. They they set up this meeting and got the other two speakers involved. And then, and, you know, I got involved. Um, if it was up to me, this still wouldn't be happening because we're still really busy, as is everyone. So a big thank you to, to Christine and, and Abby on that. And that sort of being busy links into what I'm going to talk about to today. So it's a good segue. Um, the, the, the title of the talk that's on the agenda is not quite what I'm going to present on. Um, Lee is going to talk more about the, the wider um, marketing, digital marketing mix in the state of the nation a bit more than I am. I'm going to kind of hyper focus uh, down onto the HCPs or our customers and the field teams. So what's happening with the field teams, what we saw in 2020, and then what my new soapbox is or has been since March last year, which is enabling and empowering the multi-channel rep. So that's what I'm going to go through today. Um, it's all about that for me. Um, and then Lee's going to expand on that into the wider marketing mix. And then John's got some really interesting stuff around um, finding your customers on other platforms, which I, I can't wait to hear. I have to admit, it's, it's new to me, that side of things. So um, what happened in 2020? Um, like everyone knows what happened in 2020, but I'm going to give you some, some data around this. Um, in terms of the actual point of lockdown um, in Europe, we saw a significant uptick in Viva Engage. So Viva Engage is the 
remote platform that reps use to engage with customers to deliver sales calls, pretty much. Um, so you saw an uptick, and not surprisingly, but it was really quick between that one week of lockdown that was happening across Europe from 17,000 meetings to 64,000 meetings. So in there, there was an immediate uptick in the number of remote meetings held, even right early days at the point of lockdown. So interesting pivot by the industry, quick, and, and should point out, Viva, very... Uh, clever and supportive by giving six months license to existing Viva customers to engage um, for uh, um, pro bono at that point, um, which really helped the industry, but also is really, you know, helped be, helped the, the momentum get behind uh, Viva Engage. So what did it look like in terms of the activity in Viva? Now, making no excuses here, it's all about Viva today for me because it is the dominant platform in the pharmaceutical space right now. You have got other platforms uh, like Microsoft's uh, omnipresence. Um, but those of you know, Chris Wade's moved over to that side of things and is making waves. And then, of course, we've got iCubia's OCE, or Orchestrated Customer Engagement Platform. Fascinating platform, really interesting. But it's all about Viva nowadays, um, and it probably will be for the foreseeable. So I borrowed these slides, copyright Viva, there from their pulse data and from various um, engagements I've had with them. So what, what happened at that point in time? Not surprisingly, a 52% drop in calls. So half of our customers and half of our calls went away. Um, and then even more so, not you know the live events the, dropped further. But interestingly, and not surprisingly, approved emails. So approved emails, rep triggered emails, they are uh, approved, pre-approved uh, adaptable emails that reps can send to their customers to make core claims about the brand. That went up by 263%, and that's been maintained. And then engage meetings up by 2,347%. So this tells you a couple of things, um, really. One of which is we pivoted pretty quickly. Um, Viva did an amazing job providing, you know, provisioning all those licensing and get people set up. That's why we were partly so busy with so many customers moving over to that. But it also means that potentially our customers are also getting 263% more emails. Uh, and those are requests for meetings and all the rest of it. So I'm going to touch on something that's been termed digital pollution. That is, you know, how do we, and this is kind of what the topic is today, how do we stand out from all of that, um, those emails going out into our customers' inboxes? Um, what did that, another way of looking at this in terms of the uptick, and there's some more interesting data here, um, the US versus Europe. Um, even before COVID, remote calls were longer in there were, were, were longer calls than face-to-face, -face. but really interesting in the state, it really jumped up. What I like most about this slide and what it really tells me is that despite everything, with everything going on with lockdown and COVID and even with HCPs on the front line, HCPs as worried as normal, as normal people, it's called HCPs, not normal, the average person about what COVID meant to them and to their family, they still wanted to see us as an industry. So, um, you know, that we are presenting back value our customers. There's something we have that they're in. Um, I always say at this point, my dad is a GP, or he was. And uh, when I became a medical rep back in the day, I was a little worried about what he'd think about me, um, what, you know, joining the dark side. And actually, he's very positive about medical reps. So they, they provide an awful lot of information condensed and summarized in, in a way that I couldn't possibly read myself. You know, you've got to add in a pinch of salt, et cetera. But we have real value to offer our customers. Um, so that's what I really like about this, this graph. It shows that despite everything, they were keen to engage. Right. Was that sustained through 2020? Um, again, Viva's Pulse data. Um, yes, it was sustained that, you know, oh, come on. Sorry, my chat's in the way. So engaged meetings started up by 794% and sustained through to October, um, as you can see. So not only did we manage to get going quite quickly as an industry, we had some clients that were up and running by April on Engage, and we've had other clients that were just scrambling at the end of December to get there. But, you know, it, it, it depended where they were on the um, technology um, in the first place. And then what about from the HCP side? Um, and this is where I was worried that Chris is going to be on the call because, you know, he's going to ask this sort of question. I'm afraid I don't know if this is U.S., Glo uh, sorry, global or U EU data. So uh, best guess is on this. And if Stacy's on the call from Viva, maybe you can check. I meant to check before this. But either way, when you look at it, 20,000 meetings per day, 
someone cleverer than me than say that's probably global or European. But there's a there's a rating structure that happens after these engagements, um, uh, and it's 4.4 out of five. So HCPs are rating this very highly. Um, also, you have to have the app if you're going to do it on iPad or device. 800,000 downloads and then 50,000 plus user ratings. What I'm just saying here really is that I'm setting this up that we pivoted really well as an industry and so did our customers and our customers wouldn't have come along with us if we didn't represent value or bring value to that relationship. And it's my argument that the real core on that value is always gonna be the representative. And um, if they can't be doing this face-to-face, -face, then you know there's, there's, a, there's a need or a direction around being a multi-channel rep that is utilizing different channels to orchestrate customer engagement. What about customers' expectations? Um, I just realized I didn't start my time. Keep, will, will you, will you just give me a wave if I'm prattling on and coming to the end because I've, I forgot to put my timer on. So how have our customers' expectations changed? Um, so this is data that um, M3, doctors.net, surveyed back in uh, March and April. Uh, May, April, May last year. So this is pre-COVID. Um, who have you seen in the last six months? And these are about sort of engagement figures we'd expect to see in primary care and secondary care for reps, CAMs and MSLs. So of that customer base, when asked who already engaged with the industry, um, when you look back at historical data, this is well before COVID. Um, this is a, a Cross Health, lovely health navigator. And we used to use this all the time to try and get our pharma brand team clients and our agencies to focus on the remote space. Because even before COVID, it was it is important, right? If you look at that, narrow it down, you could increase your reach to customers by 13% by adopting remote channels to allow the rep to engage with the customer remotely. So even before COVID, it was important. But what happened with COVID? So this is now up. So when you say after the pandemic, after COVID, that's obviously open to interpretation. But in terms of HCPs expecting to return to face-to-face -to -face engagements, you know, on the surface, it looks okay. 71% of secondary care expecting to engage with reps, 65% in primary care. But if you flip that around, that's approximately a third of primary care clinicians unsure if they'll return to face-to-face, -to -face, or a quarter of secondary care clinicians unsure if they're going to return to CCAMs and MSLs. So... The origin or the origin of this presentation, which has been evolving since March last year, it actually came from when I was um, asked to present to a sales team about what the situation was, what they had available to them, and really to get their buy-in and hearts and minds, win over hearts and minds on becoming a multi-channel rep. Um, and so this is really important data because this isn't a flash in the pan. Uh, I know we use the phrase, the new normal and all that kind of stuff too much. But in essence, things have changed. There are going to be a third or a quarter of our customers that are going to want to engage remotely, not face to face in the future. And in fact, if you look at channel preference, which Lee will talk a lot more about. So this was um, pre-COVID and again, post-COVID, again, from the same survey from doctors.net. Um, Pre-COVID, there was a preference towards face to face. That's the pink on the top line. Um, with, so the middle's like, um, you know, 50-50 either side or 40-60-60-40. But you can see post-COVID, there's a significant shift to the undecided or the, the middle ground, but over to the, the internet or, or remote engagement. So things have changed and they will, will remain changed and, and we need to respond to that. It's my belief that at the heart of that is the multi-channel rep and orchestrating the customer engagement. So that's, should have waited till then to say that. How do we respond? We respond by empowering and enabling the multi-channel rep, amongst other things. So again, this presentation was given to a field team who were, how to put it, so the crisis accelerated uptake of technology last year was so rapid for so many people that it left them behind. Digital transformation takes time, takes planning, and most of that planning is around training hearts and minds and stakeholder management, but it happened so rapidly last year. That combined with many in the field worried about the future, how many people will remain in the field if my job is secure. So when you throw multi-channel into that, if you're an old school rep who maybe has been resisting CRM and CLM solutions, then this seems even more like a threat. Um, and yet 
they have huge value to us, of course, because often those reps are the ones with the longest term relationships with their customers, et cetera. So this was designed to really just, you know, um, get away from this, okay? Now I love this from Moen Health. Um, the, it's the, the, the multi-channel periodic table. There are so many channels available to us. And there's so many things involved in it from analytics to audience segmentation and all of that. But really multi-channel just means what it says, it's more than one channel. And I challenge that even when I was a rep, uh, we were multi-channel reps. And I am literally that we had carbon paper to record our calls. So to submit them to Dendrite, we had a tiny little form and you'd sit there in your car and you'd scribble on it and it would copy through to the other paper. You'd tear that bit off and put it in the post to Dendrite to, to, for some poor data operator to put it in. But even back then I was a multi-channel rep. Why? Because I could leave things with the with the um, the HCPs. I could even use email. We did have email back then. I could email things through. Um, I could invite them to local meetings. I could um, set up a call with the medic or bring the MSL in. Um, I could get them to international congresses, or I could see them face to face. So I had these other channels that I was doing. So really, we've now just got more, and we've got some digital channels. But what we're doing is still the same thing. We are delivering the right content to the right customer at the right time to move them along the adoption ladder. Um, and that, that can look like this. So this is my rep in the middle. And this is my, still, I'm saying again, my belief that the, the rep is still at the heart of um, encouraging appropriate prescribing. So for me, a lot of the other things that we do are about brand awareness. It's about moving people, tickling people along, but it's the rep and the engagement with the customer it, it, that's gonna, gonna get that, that appropriate prescribing going. So you can see here, we've got everything from face-to-face -face knee detailing. And I'm not sure there's a significant difference between those two. There's, there's some difference in content and there's some training around e-detailing versus face-to-face, -face, but essentially it's a one-to-one -one engagement where the conversation is being led by the representative, where they need to understand their customer, align the content to that understanding and then close for the sale, right? We then got rep triggered emails. Or if I use the, the term VAE, that's Viva approved email, it's shorthand, it will come out at some point. But what I mean by that is rep triggered emails. You know, MSL engagement, you know, it's now virtual educational meetings versus, you know, hiring a hotel for, for 30 delegates um, and getting a, a local chairman and an, you know, a national key opinion leader. We're now just doing that through Zoom or through Teams or through um, uh, Viva Engage. You know, back in the day, we would leave uh, cards with URLs on or, or emails with URLs on that would take the, the customer through to, um, oh God, I'm showing my age. It could be a CD-ROM, right? Do you remember back in the day, we'd give out loads of CD-ROMs with all the medical education on and stuff. So what's different today? Well, you don't need a CD-ROM uh, and you can use Viva approved emails and things to link to that. So again, just because I've used so much of Viva's data and because it's so prevalent, I'm not paid by Viva, by the way, or anything like that, but it's just it's just what is, right? So in terms of what are the main channels for, for our reps, and this is relevant to everyone on the call, if you're involved in content creation, um, and supporting your brand teams and what that is. I'm sure you're all familiar with these now, right? But CRM engaged meeting, that is, well, it's Zoom built in uh, to Viva. It allows the reps to do one-to-ones. It allows the reps to do meetings. Um, they now have a, a new uh, product or newish product called uh, Engage for Events, which is specific line to integrate with the meetings and events module to allow the reps to run local meetings, um, and not local meetings, speaker meetings, right? So a chairman, a speaker, and hosted by the rep. Um, you know, what's interesting about that for our field teams, and one of the ways to sort of sell in the value of, of being digitally multi-channel rather than, you know, in IRL multi-channel, is that those local meetings that they organize can actually be made available to all of their peers and colleagues around the country, or vice versa. So, you know, there's no way that a local meeting in Edinburgh would ever have been attended by to by a local sorry, a London um, clinician. But now all of the effort that you put into a local meeting, like we are doing you know, today, you know, wherever you are based, you can attend that meeting. So we can get a lot more bang for our buck on that. CRM engage for portals. Um, not seeing a lot of this, but I think it's a really important aspect. And again, it's orchestrated by the rep, but it's, it's self-led detailing. Self-led detailing is, is common practice, but it's through um, a doctors.net and other platforms where you know the, the banner ad brings them in and the clinician works through their own sales aid you know through their own journey but you know that can be um, triggered by the representative through VAEs and allows them to to paint that customer journey and then CRM approved email or VAEV approved email 
absolutely the lifeblood of all of this because it's really what um, joins all of this up for the rep and also really, really um, engaging and interesting analytics. Some of the analytics around um, what you do in a sales call can be interesting, but that sales call is led. It's led by the representative, whereas both engage for portals, it's led by the clinician and choices they make are not guided by the, the rep, but also what are they opening and what are they clicking on within the e emails? Now, it's really interesting. It's not being led by the uh, rep, so it might give you more insights into what they're doing. So when you look at this, all of those tools within Viva enable the multi-channel rep, and that's really what's happened at a great hurry over the last year. And I think we're going to be seeing maybe some unstitching of what been, what's been done from a business continuity point of view and moving into more of a business excellence um, in this space. So why, do, why the multi-channel rep? Why, why can't we just, you know, what if we just left them to do the one-to-one -one calls and head office does all of the emails and we just treat it like we did before? Well, this is really you know, the adoption ladder that we're moving the customer along when it's uncoordinated. And I'm using a, the old flight bag that we used to carry around, um, or, or yeah, flight bag that we'd carry around uh, to represent a call. And I see that really as a, as a remote call or a face to face call. That's the, the, the key rep interaction. W without coordinated activity around that, you know, or things that are outside of the rep's control, are we really, you know, are we maximizing the impact of our content? to move the customer adoption ladder. I would argue not. I really do believe um, that the orchestrated uh, element of the customer engagement puts the rep in the middle. If we do that, and the rep's in control of what happens at what point. So after a sales call, there's a follow-up email, you know, and, and, and learning and understanding what happens from that following. Does the rep, does the customer then download the PDF from Vault? Do they access or register on the online service, online educational portal? If they do, or if they don't, maybe it triggers you a different type of email. And so you're slowly building up that experience and that customer journey in, in an orchestrated and planned way to have more of an effect. Because if we can do that, whatever your adoption ladder or fancy term for an adoption ladder is, you know, the whole point of what we're doing here is around appropriate prescribing. And that happens when you move them in a coordinated way along that adoption ladder. Um, and a good, well-enabled multi-channel rep you're going to get that increased frequency, increased reach, and that tailored approach to moving the customer on the adoption ladder. So rep orchestrated customer engagement. I, I have lifted that phrase from the IQVIA solution, right? OC, I think it's a really good name, right? But in this case, I've appended it with, with rep. Okay, so their OCE is, is kind of much more a marketing, selling, marketing and sales integration piece than maybe Viva is. But really from the rep's perspective, like I said, it's delivering the right content and messaging through the right channels at the right time to effectively move the HCP along the adoption ladder and increase appropriate prescribing. COVID's just made this more important. My belief is, and I'm sure many is, that that was something we were aiming for pre-COVID. But this, this is where we're at, what's more important in 2021. So really, what could we do to enable so this? So that a lot of what you saw was what I've been presenting to field teams over the last six to eight months to help them understand what's happened to their customers, help them understand that their role is not very different when we just call it multi-channel. In fact, there's good opportunities and they're at the heart of it, they're in control of it. But really what can we do to enable them? Um, so first of all, around a toolkit, um, we need clear customer engagement, um, customer segmentation, right? You need to understand that, but it needs to be, and you'll, you'll see a theme here, it needs to be in the CRM. Right, customer segmentation that exists in an Excel document somewhere that the reps fill in when they're asked to and then never refer to again is a waste of money and time and effort. Right? We're going to go to the effort of segmenting our customers. Let's make sure that's held within the CRM because we can use it and we can analyze it over time. Channel preferences. Okay, this is a fantastic opportunity to re engage with our customers and to ask them, well, you know, with everything going on, you know, how do you want me to contact you? Is it email and remote? You know, will you be going back to face to face? Do, you know, can I invite you to webinars, et cetera? There's really, especially for those reps that already have relationships with their customers, really got an opportunity to do that. But let's get it in the CRM. Let's have fields in the CRM that show you channel preferences, because again, we can use it and we can analyze it. Consent process, right? It's gold dust right now. If you don't have consent, you're stuffed, right? So how do you get consent? It's all about 
well, for the, again, for reps to have good solid relationships with their customers and maybe didn't have electronic consent previously, they can just ask for it. But for those that don't, or you've got a launch or you know, you're know going to a market new, think about what your high value assets are. Is it a webinar that's gonna be popular, right? So you can use that to get consent. Is it a scientific paper? And I've, I've put Trust Track here, I think I saw Peter on the, in the audience, right? Trust Track have a great solution around consent. Um, capture, but they also have a great solution around the delivery of, sci of licensed scientific literature. Sci you know, life, getting a license so you can see that clinical trial, uh, clinical paper, you know, will the doctor give consent in order to receive that? That's a high value item. But again, let's capture that in the CRM. I have to say most companies are doing this, but maybe the workflow is not as simple. You know, build the, con the consent into your sales aids so that reps know if they've got consent and they can trigger it at that point. Tools to track and move HCPs along the adoption ladder. Um, you know, it's great to say that's what we want to do. If the, if the reps just, you know, guessing where that customer is. Um, you know, have they have they prescribed? If they have prescribed, how much have they moved from? You know, tentative prescribing, etc. Moving them along. So again, let's give them the way to quantify that. Uh, you know, but also having the CRM because again, we want to know what content's working to move the customer along. And then all, at the moment, Viva's great at data, right? It's great at capturing data, analytics all over the place. It's not the best to get it out, right? Because it, it, it has to be generic for everyone. It has to fit for every use. But there's something in there called My Insights, which is a free space where we can build whatever you want. And in that, it's where you create the dashboards that enables the multi-channel rep to manage their customers, to see which customers are opening which emails, what emails are working the best, you know, if, if you send an email to a customer and two weeks later he opens it to, to look at the dosing, that's a really solid sign, right? Maybe we should follow up on that. What else? Okay. Um, I think it's really important when we look at marketing personas, we're very good at doing customer journeys. But I believe this is something now in the multi-rep space we need to be looking at ourselves or, or the reps do is having the ability to know what content they should be using with the customer at what time or what channel they should be using or should you know what impact the webinars have so give them the tools to plan in a basic way the customer journey and then we can align the content to that so that's the right content aligned to customer segments and the stages on that adoption ladder so i haven't gone into it today and i know a lot of you on the call are going to be from the agency side so content's really key your content producers your ideators and creators budgets it's going to become an issue this year for content creation because we need so much more of it, right? So we're seeing customers burn through six months worth of content in six weeks, right? And there's an issue with that is you can't just keep creating content. You don't have the budget for it and compliance can't keep up with you. So it's really important that content gets used properly. So not just sent out willy nilly, but properly aligned to the customer's needs at that point in time. Um, the big trends that you're going to see around that is digital asset management. So, you know, making sure that the assets are used wisely and reused, modular publishing, personalized content, and underneath that, all, all of content reuse. And actually all the things I've said before are relevant to that, to making sure the rep sends the right content out, not just willy-nilly or wasting that content. Optimize for face-to-face -face and remote engagement. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm not gonna dwell on that, but you know, uh, we are gonna go back to face-to-face. -to -face. So content should work in both settings, but bear in mind that in remote, there's some challenges around screen sizes. We've observed a lot of calls and I think the biggest challenge is reps fall into a tell cell because they're selling to a very small picture of the doctor and they're looking at their content. And even the best reps seem to lose their curiosity and fall into slide after slide after slide. So as content creators, we need to look at how we can force their hand a bit, give them punctuation marks where they stop and ask questions, You know, have interactive content where we're finding out the treatment goals and treatment priorities of the HCP so that we can align that content that follows and then close against that. Ensure content is designed and built with analytics in mind. Analytics are not something you throw in at the end. It's something that you build the content to deliver. So everything from content performance to KPI tracking and customer impact. And then also ensuring it's flexible. This, I just tagged this on because I found it fascinating. The last few uh, months of working with reps is however good your Viva approved email is, however good your rep triggered email is, if it doesn't fit with how they communicate to that particular doctor, they will not use it, right? And I come across so strongly. It's if I know as John and I've 
know who he is and we, you know, and we meet regularly um, and I, I, he's more than just a customer, I'm not going to send him an email that says, that says dear Dr. John Smith. It's going to break, it's going to be weird and, and upset the relationship, right? So think about what it's like as a rep to communicate with customers you've known for a while. Give them the flexibility to communicate in the way they would communicate with that customer if they had full freedom. And then lastly, it's, it's really hearts and minds. Um, so it's about what we build for reps to use, what we create, what we ideate for reps to use. Um, it needs to, um, sorry, let me go back a bit. In terms of what we need to do is train, engage, motivate, and reward multi-channel approach and the use of CRM, CLM. We can't just expect it to happen. Um, we need to kind of catch up on the digital transformation that didn't happen in because everyone just got on with it in 2020. 2021 is a bit more like rebuilding some of those bridges and bringing people along. And I think we need to be looking at, at that um, reward bit of the multi-channel approach. Um, and this is, sorry, this is where, where I got a little bit confused in my, in my order. Um, Whatever it is that we ask them to use needs to be clearly um, built for their benefit. Because at the end of the day, if it works for them, we're going to get appropriate prescribing. So if you have analytics that are built in, those analytics are not to police and monitor their activity. It's to help them know what to be doing next. It's to inform and in give them insights so they have better sales or better good sell outcomes. So in summary, um, COVID strategically changed the landscape. This rapid increase uh, of digital, and so crisis accelerated uptake of, of digital solutions. We know that HCPs aren't likely to fully return to, to what it was like pre COVID. There is this potential for digital pollution. Everyone's out there, everyone's sending emails, everyone's doing things around that. So, how do we stand out from that? And I believe that's giving the reps the right tools so they know how to stand out from that. And that's all down to this enabling and empowering the multi channel rep. Um, I'm really interested in anyone who wants to collaborate in that space. I'm not talking about, um, you know, uh, if you need us to build stuff for you and we're gonna charge you. I'm just really interested in anyone who's working in the multi-channel space, has something interesting to talk about. That's my details, give me a bell. I'd really like to engage. Great, thanks very much, James. That was amazing, that was really interesting. And we really are in unprecedented times for a uh, farmer. I mean, during COVID with the whole race to the vaccines, et cetera, it's a uh, farmer was seen in the old days as the, uh, the estate agents and now they've gone from zero to hero so it's an exciting time uh, to be in this industry. So our next speaker uh, up is uh, Lee Hope, uh, for, uh, she's the owner of Bee Pharma um, and her topic is from push to pull, building trust with customers via blended approach and uh, Lee has, um, for her being in the industry that improves the lives of patients has always been a privilege and uh, being part of a, a small part of that change to enable brands to better connect with HCPs and patients in a way that matches the way they live and work is what challenges her and her team every day. So over to you, Lee. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> okay, are we good? Can you see me? See my screen? Yeah, all good. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you for the introduction, Christine, and um, to yourself and James. Thanks very much for the opportunity to come along um, and be part of this uh, this forum. I nearly made it to the Gilead meeting just before it got pulled in real life uh, last year. So I've never made it in, in person to one of these meetings. So yeah, it's really nice to just be here and on the panel today. Um, I was just thinking about it when I first started thinking about this presentation back in December, despite it being the start of the winter season, it really felt like the end was in sight um, with the, the vaccines coming. And of course, that's uh, that's not the case at the minute. Um, you know, we're in this sort of period of protracted disruption. And I think, you know, in pharma, we've known for a very long time that we need to be doing things differently than we did before from a digital perspective. And I think, you know, it's more important than ever that we start thinking about how do we really um, sort of embrace this digital approach, you know, in an integrated way. And what are the commercial realities of that for, you know, across the industry? So, yeah, really grateful to be able to just sort of shine a spotlight on the, the challenges and the opportunities that that's going to that that's going to bring us. So, um I think this time last year, most of us hadn't even heard of COVID. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, 
most people remember that moment when it just sort of hit them, the reality of it, you know, how serious it actually was. And for me, I had to look at my diary. It was the 24th of February and I was on a train on my way into London. And as fate would have it, to meet three colleagues from Milan. And it was that morning that the news was coming out of Italy about how serious things were in the north. And I remember just looking at my mobile thinking, what do I do here? Do I get off this train? Do I turn around? You know, what should I do? But, you know, I think once we all got over the initial shock of, you know, what had happened and, you know, looked after our families and our teams and our supply chains and got, you know, back to work, realised that there was a big job to be done. Um, not only in how we kept some engagement with our customers and our stakeholders in the short term, but actually, you know, how we were going to evolve that, you know, quite rapidly because everything was changing so quickly. So we're going to have a look at the world of a patient in 2021, January 2021, you know, how things have changed for um, uh, our, our stakeholders, HCP specifically in this case. And then um, we'll have a look at the bigger picture for pharma. We'll go through and see, you know, what we are, are doing and what we can be doing to sort of approach all of these changes. And then I've brought a, a case study that I can give you a look at at the end, just to help illustrate, you know, what it can actually mean to build trust and engagement with, um, you know, with your customer base um, over time. So, um, you know, patients like the rest of us are experiencing all this disruption. They're working from home. They are teaching their children at home. You know, the juggle is real and life is complicated. Um, and, you know, if you're seeing the physio or if you've got an appointment with your GP or if you're a newly diagnosed patient and all of the sort of um, considerations there, if you are a chronic patient, you know, the whole interaction and sort of relationship that you've got with your care team, um, A, it's likely to be virtual at the minute and, you know, it has really changed. You know, patient journeys are very different now than they were this time last year across, you know, most therapy areas and across primary care and you know patients are not accessing care the way that they were previously for you know various reasons either they're reluctant to um, go to their GP or to hospital because of the fear of infection or they can't get an appointment or you know for whatever reason access to treatment is down and patients are falling through the gaps um, so you know on the flip side of that there is a much better awareness of health and people and um, this is a, a survey carried out by GSK at the end of the summer last year and um, two-thirds of adults are now factoring in health in their day-to-day -day decision making so there's a bit of a di dichotomy there um, but you know basically the way that patients are flowing through the system has fundamentally changed and um, you know there's going to be knock-on effects uh, uh, you know across the the whole the whole um, health system and you know only time will tell what the fallout of that is. I think we don't even, you know, know what that's gonna that's gonna entail. Um, and I think G, or GPs and secondary care physicians were looking forward to some stability in 2021, looking after their patients. Um, so just as an example, you know, their their digital world has or their their working world has become much more digital. Um, so three quarters of GP practices are now using uh, platforms like Zoom um, to uh, liaise with their team compared to three percent the year before um, time with their patients you know most of them think that the the level at the minute of remote consultation is too high but they figure when restrictions are lifted it'll be somewhere around the 50 50 mark which is you know a massive shift in how they're dealing with their patients sort of on a larger scale um, across trusts there's a a measure that um, in the NHS use of 15 diagnostic tests, and that has dropped to uh, August last year by 41%. So to put that in perspective, that is um, 600,000 fewer MRI scans than to that point last year. And the number of patients who are waiting more than 18 weeks, which is like the golden figure for uh, NHS, has doubled to November last year. So just monumental shifts. And I think, you know, what that means is there's going to have to be some like innovation and creative thinking around how we play catch up because, you know, um, I suppose healthcare systems are going to have to embrace their own digital transformations to sort of, you know, make any headway in, you know, 
um, drive inefficiencies to play, you know, to catch up and, and um, you know, get things back where they need to be. So where does that leave pharma? Um, I think, you know, James, as you said earlier, we're in the headlines for the right reasons for once. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so much great work has been done. And, you know, this is a sort of snapshot of some IQVIA data. You know, globally revenues have been pretty resilient. They haven't been affected very much. Um, these are MAT uh, figures to September last year. And when it comes to the sort of the number of remote rep contacts with their face-to-face -face or meetings, that has recovered really pretty, um, you know, pretty impressively in the UK, despite it being a pretty low contact market. I think what we need to be aware of, certainly in the UK, is that we might be a bit of an outlier in terms of um, how quickly we return to face-to-face -face levels that were previous. Um, when you look at when restrictions were lifted last year, the bounce back was a lot better in the other EU um, five countries. I think James um, uh, quoted a figure that I was going to talk about today as well. You know, a third of UK HCPs think that they will not be going back to seeing reps face-to-face. That's a lot of customers. So I think, you know, we'll have to be kind of mindful of that as well. So if we look at the bigger promotional investment across the EU, it did fall off last year. And, you know, that's hardly surprising when you think about, you know, all of these projects that were paused or um, pulled or delayed. And when you look at the um, activities that are tagged as digital, it still only makes up, you know, a fraction of the overall promotional spend. So if you look in the bottom right here, this is some Indigene data. And what that is showing, so basically that's, um, you know, the sales team cost stripped out and it's just focusing on DME spend. And what that's telling us is that over the next couple of years, more than half of companies are going to be spending more than half of their budget um, on digital. So, you know, things are evolving, things are changing. Um, but that sort of gives you a top line picture of the, the world of pharma at the minute. So, you know, customer expectations have already changed. And I think, you know, um, we can probably, you know, look at two main areas where we can actually build some ba value back into the system. Um, and one of those areas is trust. And the other one is experience. You know, what experience do we want our customers to have so you know on one hand our customers really want to keep engaging with us um, as an industry so at the height of uh, covid lockdown you know all the data was saying they want to engage they want to continue working with us you know they like the partnerships that they have with pharma and um, they want our information they want our experience but when you look at all of the research behind um HCP journeys online, pharma content always seems to be the last port of call when they're, when they're, they're searching. And, you know, you're the expert on your brand. So you really, you know, in any under, other industry, you need to be part of that, um, that response. So I think, you know, it's a bit of a dichotomy, really. They want to engage with us, but they don't trust the information that we provide. So how do we resolve that? So there's a couple of absolute must-haves that we have to address. And I think, you know, we've got to make sure that, I think, James, you mentioned it earlier, you know, there's this drive for more content and we need more and we need it faster. And I think that's a topic in itself. Um, but I think the content that we are getting out there, you know, it has to be perceived as, a, as, as objective. And one of the best ways that we can do that is to create it with our customers. And I think we're very good at doing that in pharma um, via traditional channels. And, you know, it has to be up to date. So if you're presenting data at a conference and it's not you who's streaming it or um, creating some really great content off the back of it and, um, you know, making sure that you're first out with that, your customer's going to find that somewhere else. Another, you know, really important piece around how we get our customer base to trust us is make sure that the environment that we're hosting all these sites and assets in our, um, the environment is secure. And, you know, we've got to be accountable. So, you know, whatever permissions and, pre and preferences that they're um, providing to us, we've got to make sure that we're using that properly and respecting that. You know, if we're getting customers to register with us for our content, then that's got to be a justifiable sort of exchange and they've got to, you know, appreciate the, the content um, that they're getting back there. And, you know, 
it's back to it's back to this point about personalization. You, you're never going to be able to replicate that sequential sale that you get with a brilliant key account manager. You know, one month they're going in talking about efficacy. The next week it's about adverse event profile. The next week it's about, you know, value. And then they're going in and they're doing a single patient focus call and they're saying, you know, can I have a, a, an ex patient um, in your clinic this afternoon? You know, it's a much more fragmented funnel online. So you can't really replicate that sequential sale. But, you know, what I think we can do to augment those relationships and that activity is make sure that we're personalizing these digital columns the best that we can. And, you know, I think any data that I've seen from HCPs, you know, expecting digital comms, you know, they want that message to be tailored and they want it to include um, previous interactions, whether that's with the company, the brand, whether it's with a, a real life person, whether it's at a meeting. So I think that's one of the major challenges that we have in the industry. How do you integrate all of these touch points? And I think, you know, for us to really achieve that data driven decision making that we really are aiming for, um, you know, it's a bit of a holy grail, the single source of truth. And, you know, it's a real challenge. How do we, you know, piece together all of those touch points? And I think, you know, James was coming up with some fantastic solutions there around, you know, how do you build that into CRM? So that's all quite interesting stuff. Um, and then just sort of drilling down more into the user experience part of it, because I think, you know, HCPs are just comparing their experiences online with pharma brands uh, to the experiences they have with other brands. So, you know, whatever you can do to make it as friction free and seamless as possible, you know, is going to make you, you know, um, you know, feel much more trustworthy. And I think, you know, speed is off the essence, you know, online attention spans are short. And I think if you want to be the person who's providing the answer to a particular question, then you've got to make sure that you're making it very easy for people to, you know, your audience to find your content. And a lot of that is around sort of searchability. And I think from my experience, you know, working with pharma companies, I think, you know, they really do underestimate the importance and the power of, um, you know, optimizing your, your, your page load speed and, you know, whether you're mobile friendly, you know, all of this technical SEO where you're making sure that your content's tagged properly and, you know, it's all properly indexed so that, you know, Google knows what content you've got on your site so that um, your audience can find all of your information. And, you know, again, anything that you can do to make it sort of more seamless. So if you can make your content available on uh, offline, for example, you know, you can make it available for download. You can create personal vaults where, you know, um, customers can go in and curate content so that when they come back, they don't have to research for it, a bit like your watch list on, um, on Amazon Prime or Netflix. Um, so yeah, and you know, obviously, you know, the more channels, you know, appropriately, you know, that you can appropriately use to um, to place your content where you can, you know, place sponsored content, you know, the better. But, you know, it's also quite helpful to have a central hub where you've got, you know, clear signposts and, you know, the navigation is right so that your audience can find their, the information they're looking for properly and they don't necessarily have to go anywhere else to find that once they, they've reached you. So, yeah, anything you can do to make it easier, really. So I thought it'd be helpful to have a look at, you know, some specifics around what pharma companies really value in terms of, um, you know, uh, assets and, um, you know, activities uh, from a digital perspective that we might have to offer. You know, if you want to make some headway when you're choosing what you spend your budget on, you're probably going to get more, you um, return on investment from, you know, a high quality scientific meeting or online education, then potentially you are, you know, trying to get your customers to follow you on Twitter. And I think, you know, social media is sitting there at the bottom. And I know that John's going to be talking to us about some, you know, uh, some, you know, channels that are, that are open to us that we may be using in part, or, you know, that we could be exploiting a lot more than we are now. And I think, you know, as, you know, as things evolve in the online space, then, you know, that might be something that moves up the list a bit. And it's maybe just the fact that this experience is not there, that that's at the bottom. Um, but, you know, at the same time, our healthcare professionals, our customers are saying these are, these are of, you know, of value, of very high value. So that's always reassuring. 
So in terms of how this actually can, you know, exist in real life, um, I've brought along a case study. Um, this is a, a project that we have been working on since 2017. It's with a relatively small UK affiliate. And <clears throat> it originally um, started life as an online educational platform. And all was all co-created with um, experts, so with uh, KOLs. And luckily for us, you know, the, the, the management team at this company were, you know, prepared to take a relatively long-term view, um, which, you know, really was helpful in the get-go. And the first sort of phase of this uh, whole project was very much sort of, um, you know, scientific uh, educational content. Um, and that was what, that's what, that's what uh, it, it started life as. And sort of what that looked like to a member was um, they had uh, like an educational program of scientific led modules you know they're all very interactive um, they had you know the 3d animation and um, they were you know they were put they were they were put together with um you know the key the key needs in mind basically and all developed and now there's 1800 registered users on the platform so it has really grown in audience size and scope and um whenever it was sort of in, in its development stages you know, we, there was a lot of test and learn about it. And I think that's what we have to realize with, you know, our digital projects within brand teams, you know, we're not always going to get things right in the first instance. And we do have to, you know, try things. And I think the culture when you're, you know, trying to build in digital um, upskilling and expertise across any organization at enterprise level, you've got to be prepared for that. And I remember when we first started off, you know, um, we were getting a trickle of maybe 10, 11, 12 registrations every week. You know, at the very start of it, um, it was all about raising awareness and we were employing various tactics across the board to do that. So optimizing our organic search, using email permissions where we had them, placing banner ads in relevant, relevant journals, you know, using the sort of sales and marketing channels where we could just to um, you know, get the awareness up and, and reach the, the right audience, if you like. And, you know, actually that momentum really started to build quite quickly. And I think once you really start getting that engagement and that loyalty, that's when you can start introducing, you know, more product specific um, promotional content. So then we were able to add, you know, um, product specific modules, um, you know, case studies, KOL talking heads and um, technique videos. So, you know, then this sort of range of content was able to um, broaden out and the whole thing was zoned. There was a virtual clinic added. Um, and, you know, the whole thing has grown over time. It has really developed in terms of the number of registered users. You know, there's loads of hard metrics that you can use to sort of figure out, you know, how you're performing against objectives. And, you know, obviously, you know, how many people are registering, um, you know, you know, there's a there's so many things that you can measure through Google Analytics and the platform itself, just to see how your engagement is actually um, how your engagement is actually working. So it's still going strong three years later. Um, we've got a demo version of this. If anybody wants to, you know, see it in any more detail, be very very happy to go through it with you. Um, but I think one of the proudest moments for us around this was um, when COVID hit last year. You know, obviously the sales team had to come off the road, but you know, the company had this captive audience, if you like, of 1,800 of their target customers. And, you know, they're really able to respond, you know, very proactively to the needs of, of that customer base. So from a clinical point of view, from a practical point of view, um, we put together um, a new online meeting space where they were able to host events. And um, they were KOL-led events hosted by the company. And they, they hosted one a month um throughout lockdown and they were able to attract um in the region of about 400 delegates to each of those webinars which was really um you know quite phenomenal when you think about it so it really ended up being a fantastic channel um for them to engage with their customers so i think you know i suppose we don't ever want to have to you know prove our point by something like that again not in this lifetime anyway 
But I think the point is, you know, if you really do take the time to invest in a resource like this, um, and you gain the loyalty and engagement of your, your customers, then it does pay off. But, you know, it's not something that you can do overnight. You have to take the long-term view. Um, so I think if I were, you know, where I was four years ago, looking after a brand in pharma, I think what I would be asking myself is, you know, what does my brand plan look like this year? I hope it looks nothing like it looked like four years ago because, you know, that would not be that would not be right at all. We would not be on the right track. I think I would be asking myself, how am I really adding value to my stakeholders? Whether you know we're looking to interact with payers for reimbursement and access to treatment for patients, you know, how can we actually you know support them to, I don't know, you know, um, enhance or improve our you know, or digitize their, or, or add, you know, digital expertise to their um, care pathways um, across the healthcare system, or whether we're working with patient groups, whatever that stakeholder is, you know, optimizing that channel mix, fishing where the fish are, and making sure that, you know, you understand those patient journeys, those um, sort of HCP landscapes and how they've changed. I know, I suppose the next best, best actions for all those online interactions to just build that trust and, and grow your long-term engagement. I think I would also be talking to my whole team about how do we find every single scrap of data and make sure that we're tracking all of those interactions because I think to build that sort of data-driven decision-making approach, that's what we need to do. And then the last point is, you know, I don't think I would be making much headway as, you know, a brand team lead to do this because it's at a much more fundamental sort of organizational level. And that's how do we sort of gear ourselves as a at enterprise level, you know, to um, really deliver on, you know, this change that, that, that needs to happen um, digitally. So how do we upskill our teams? How do we, you know, make sure that we've got the right talent mix and the right sort of um, skill mix at an organizational level so that we're able to sort of reflect, you know, the, the fast paced of, uh, evolution of what's happening with our customers. So, you know, it's ambitious, but I think, you know, it's a time for leaders to sort of set us, you know, an aspirational level of change. And uh, yeah, I think we need to do things uh, a bit differently. But uh, yeah, hopefully that has been, you know, useful to, to somebody anyway. And uh, yeah, I think that's it for me, Christine. Lovely, thanks Lee, that was great. Great to see how the landscape's changed and uh, what we have to bear in mind. Um, just to let you know as well, Abby has shared um, all the speakers' emails on the chat. And if you guys have got any questions, if you could put them in the Q&A section, that'd be amazing. Uh, when, and we'll, we'll tackle those uh, at the panel discussion at the end. So it just leads me to introduce uh, John McMahon, because um, he is going to be our next speaker. And he's going to be talking about um, how to find your customers on LinkedIn, Spotify, Pinterest, and more. So John is CEO at uh, MCM uh, Net, the digital marketing agency he founded 22 years ago. And as a passionate ma marketer, he loves experimenting with new platforms and discovering the potential reach and marketing options of all the channels available. So take it away, John. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, Christine. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, listening to those two talks beforehand, um, you heard the content word mentioned a lot of times. Uh, James talked about the adoption ladder as well um, and the awareness phase that um, Lee was just talking about in her presentation there. And what I want to talk to you about today is alternative channels that you can use more for that awareness phase. So um, can pharma use digital ads? Um, there is a lot of talk about that. It's always been a scary space, digital, how do we do, how do we get past our compliance, etc. But with the content you've got there, you've presumably already got past your in-house compliance rules. There are then some platform rules with Google and some of the others uh, that you do need to follow. But at the end of the day, these platforms want your money. Um, so if you've created engaging, useful, educating content um, that the audience wants to download, that'll be fine to put there. Um, and I think everyone knows, and from the talks just then, pharma as an industry are a little bit behind other industries as far as digital marketing goes. Uh, and a lot of it is because of those reasons and because it's been face to face so far. Uh, which means the opportunities there are absolutely huge because it's an auction. Google's an auction, any of the platforms are an auction uh, and it depends how many people are there. So the early adopters uh, are, are going to win much more on these platforms. 
Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about is a whirlwind of stats. I know it's the end of the day, but I'm going to give you lots of stats at the end of the day about some of these alternative channels. I'm not going to talk to you about Google today. You all know about Google, you know it exists, uh, and maybe it's not exactly the right sort of area for you either. Have you thought about Spotify? Now, Spotify, we all know, is something we, we use in our spare time, maybe. Um, there are 320 million active users around the world of Spotify. And it's not just youngsters, if you like, 42% of those are over 35 years of age. But only 21% of those actually have a premium account. And what that means is you can use Spotify for free, I'm sure many of you do, uh, often on a desktop, but also on your mobile as well. So you're not paying for it. So in return, Spotify want to be able to advertise to you. And they have really increased their platform and their data over the past year. Um, and the targeting options that they give you are huge. So you can display an advert and the adverts basically, they, they can be a video, they can be um, a, a usual text advert, but a lot of them are voiceover adverts and you can target them based on people's interests and their listening behavior and also what podcasts they listen to as well. And a lot of this is thinking out of the box um, and, and slightly outside of what you're used to looking at and thinking, well, the people I'm trying to aim at, what are their interests likely to be? What sort of podcasts are they likely to listen to, both in, in leisure time and in work time as well? Spotify, we found that other industries, it's an amazing tool for awareness. No one's gonna click and buy a product. There's no buy one, get one free. None of this is about that. But awareness, getting content and set to the truth of people uh, is huge on Spotify. Um, they've got something called the Spotify Ad Studio. That's only been launched a few months ago uh, in, in the, the, the way it is now. You only have to spend 250 pounds a month with Spotify to actually get onto this ad studio. And included in that, they'll create a professional voiceover for you as well. So if you look at Spotify as a giant radio station, uh, it is the reach of Spotify is bigger than a lot of radio stations put together. In the UK, look at Capital, look at Virgin, look at all, all the stations there. Spotify reaches far more people with this non-paid platform than any of the radio stations. So you can put text together, you can put it uh, across the Spotify. Within two days, normally they come back with a professional. You can choose the accent, you can choose the, 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 the sex, the voice, whatever you want, um, and they'll come back with a, a decent advert for you. Targeting options are huge. It's easy to do uh, in-house. Uh, you can do this. They've made it uh, completely easy. You've now got video ads on there as well. Just to give you an idea there of how the targeting works, you can target uh, as you'd expect by age, gender and location, but you can also target more around their interests as well. So there are all sorts of fields, um, education, news, studying. This is what people have been listening to, the areas, the podcasts, etc. It's bringing all that data in as we were talking about at, at the start of this today. There's so much data, it's scary that people are, are, are gathering on you. Um, also, we have something within Spotify that you might have seen where you choose a genre of music. So chill, gaming, travel, etc. And you can advertise around those. So the sort of mood that person's in when they're listening to the, to the different areas of music. Another one you might not have considered and maybe as early days for farmer, but it's Pinterest. Now Pinterest started as a clipboard, mainly for people doing interior decorating and design, etc. But now they've got 442 million active users. Now I do know, James, this is worldwide, but they don't tend to give out UK figures on a lot of these platforms, but they saw a massive growth in 2020, as did all of social. People are sitting at home, they're able to use this stuff much more. You're much more likely to be a higher income individual uh, if, you're, if you're using it, twice as likely as you're gonna be a higher income uh, individual. Uh, over 2 billion searches on Pinterest each month. I mean, figures like that are, are, are staggering. Um, those are people actually just searching for different ideas and inspiration and then pinning bits to their board. It's top of the funnel. So what Lee just showed us there with the funnel there, it's generating traffic and warming people up for later stages of a campaign. 60% of users of Pinterest are female. Now that's really changed because it was 83% a year ago. But one of the changes that we've seen actually happen is it's gone away from arts and crafts, etc. You still have, and that split is becoming more close to 50-50. People are using it for planning. People are using it for idea generation, etc. So it's becoming more of a business tool as well as a personal tool now as well. 
According to Pinterest, these are not my figures, marketers stand to make two pounds for every one pound they spend on the platform. How they work that out, I have no idea. Um, a few tips we'd give you as far as Pinterest goes. Um, they are slightly stricter in their approach than LinkedIn and a few other of the platforms as far as medical and, and business consumer in particular for medical products go. Um, they, they're quite sensitive at the restrictions around body types, appearance, etc. So there are maybe a few extra hoops there. Um, but they do offer two distinct types of targeting. So you've got a targeting which is search, which is basically if I'm searching for something, obviously it'll, it'll show me an advert around my search term. But also your feed is what you've been interested in the past. So it can just display adverts on a feed as well. And, and you can choose and decide which ones works best for you. As you'll find with many of the platforms as well, you can upload your own CRM data from any of the, the, the databases, that, that, such as you were talking about, James, earlier on. You can load them up. They do all the data protection for you and everything else. So they are just taking the data in and they can match the users A to people who are on Pinterest, who you've actually got within your database but also something quite exciting, which is called an actor-like audience. So they are people who are acting the same on the platform as the people you've got in your database already. So it takes your data and it, it sort of recreates, these are similar people to the people who you've been interacting with before. Um, we'd say use video on Pinterest again, uh, that's the way everything is moving, I'm sure we all know. We're all too lazy to read slides like this, etc. We like video, we like to just sit back, we don't have to read anymore. YouTube. You may have heard of this. Um, this is the number one streaming platform in the world. I think other than Netflix is probably what people spend more of their time on. The great thing is it's now powered by Google. So they're constantly innovating it. Um, and it's certainly got one of the largest user bases, continuous user bases of any of these platforms I'm talking about. The other great thing is being part of Google, the actual targeting is powered by Google Ads. So this is something that, you know, Google Ads has been going for 21 years, I think now. Uh, so Google Ads as a platform has been pretty well home. So you can target scarily precisely through here. Again, age, gender, keyword, something called customer affinity audiences you may or may not be aware of. And that again, is, it's around customers' interests, it's what they like doing. And it's that the creepy picture that Google's picked up about your search history and everything else is all in there. Um, it's as precise as advertising within Google as well, but you've got a warmer audience within here. Um, if you've got deep pockets, you can do a homepage uh, takeover of the entire of YouTube and they guarantee you 80 million impressions for that. So there you go, it might be worth considering. Why advertise on YouTube? Uh, you've got 8.6 billion monthly visits worldwide. These figures just keep going up and 73% are adults. It's not just the kids that are on YouTube. Uh, very much YouTube is being used. And again, last year for us going out, not just leisure time, but researching things as well. Uh, and also, I guess if plumbers aren't allowed to visit your house or whatever, I've, I've certainly been on there and tried a few channels as well. So there are all sorts of interests you can target. Um, 36 to 45 years of age, 67%. Um, and you can use the same targeting again. You can upload your CRM data as you can with Google too. And you can go around um, custom intent again, but also life events. Now, not sure how useful this might be to you, but you, again, it's thinking about what your customers are, but life events, getting married, etc., uh, around events that are on there that they posted, maybe something that's linked in with Facebook along those lines, or they've picked up on some of the, uh, the cookie data. Um, you can advertise around life events as well. Cost per view is typically very cheap, 0.01p to 0.05p for a view. Um, clicks can be expensive, but it's not really what YouTube is about. YouTube is much more about actually just, just getting your content, it's awareness. Um, and that you can see the click through rate typically low, less than 1%. It's a very low click through rate. And I think most of us, you know, we either skip adverts or we wouldn't actually click on an advert in YouTube. Um, but it is a brilliant top of the funnel awareness platform that can be incredibly cheap. Um, and that's why we, we'd put it as one of your sort of number one to use. I can't talk about social and non-Google without talking about Facebook. This is still, believe it or not, the largest social media platform, 2.6 billion active users. Uh, that's that 35% of the world for people like me that like their stats. Um, but 
that's not just a set of people that have, have signed up over the years. Nearly two billion of those actually go in every single day to Facebook still. So it did look as though Facebook was going to wane. Maybe the use has changed slightly, but certainly the audience is very much there. 23 minutes a day people spend on the platform. Um, there are all age ranges. There was a point where it was only the kids on Facebook. And then us as mum and dads came onto Facebook as well. So all the kids left and they went off to TikTok and Snapchat and everything else. Now, different ages use it for different things. Um, it's great for B2B and B2C, by the way, as well. Um, and again, the average cost CPM per thousand impressions, two to three pounds. So, and you can advertise, you can see on the left there with um, videos as well. Linked into that is Instagram. So Instagram and Facebook powered by exactly the same platform together, slightly smaller than Facebook, uh, but still a billion monthly users. And half of those log in every single day. Uh, 200 million people visit a business profile every day. So it did used to be, it used to be your endorsers, your celebrities, and maybe somewhere to stick your holiday snaps if you were, uh, you know, if you decided you didn't want to put them on Facebook. But now businesses are growing. If you, if you use Instagram, you'll see people are using it much more as a business tool. And again, it's working with people in, in a slightly softer environment, very, very top of the funnel. Uh, there's stories in there as well now. Uh, which all the channels have jumped on this whole stories thing. The good thing about stories is they can they, they delete, they self-delete, so you can put something up and it's not there, it's not staying there forever. Um, Facebook and Instagram being together, you target them through the same platform. So again, massively decent targeting within here. You can filter by ages, gender, location, etc. cetera. Um, Interest-based targeting, again, absolutely perfect for both of these channels and you can decide where you spend your budget across them as well. Um, again, lookalike audiences, uploading your data within here to both of them. You can magnify your data by saying, I want to put some adverts in front of people or some content in front of people who look like my existing customers. And then you can remarket to those audiences. And that again is the where, where you're followed around with a cookie and you wonder why you search for something and it's popping up on your laptop and everything else. Um, very awkward at Christmas when your wife goes onto your laptop and you're worried about what I'm going to say next. But if you are searching for a Christmas present and it comes up with slippers all over the place and that's it. So that's how that's working. Instagram, though, out of all of these, slightly smaller audience, but it's the one that engages most. Uh, it really is the king of social media as far as ads go, as far as engagement comes through. Um, that's a campaign there on the left we've been working um, with dry January, we do every year. I still haven't managed to do it myself, but the adverts do work for some people, I'm told. Um, that they are non-intrusive. They are, they are adverts that people actually like receiving because they're in the frame of mind for receiving them because you can actually be clever enough with this to only put an advert in front of somebody who has searched or is watching content that, that is relevant. Um, they've also added a shopping feed in there recently as well, so you can buy directly from the platform. Now, and I'm racing through, conscious of time, this is the big one. I'm sure you all know, this is LinkedIn. There's an awful lot of people around the world who are on LinkedIn. And again, the growth last year was scary. Top five industries uh, on there at the moment by user numbers, IT number one, but healthcare is the second largest industry on LinkedIn with 14 and a half million users. Uh, and those 14 and a half million users you can segment by job title and you can pinpoint right down to exactly the person that you want to you want to talk to biggest employer on linkedin by active employees so this is the number of people who've actually got an active profile that are using linkedin each day this one no surprise james when he heard it first it certainly surprised me when i heard it first but the number one is the nhs with 165,000, nearly 166,000 employees on LinkedIn. Now, obviously, NHS is a massive employer as one big group like that. But we have found that there are an awful lot of people within NHS. Every procurement manager seems to be on there and uses the platform pretty regularly. As far as the growth last year that I mentioned, the split between um, male and female is now nearly 50-50. Uh, there was a 55% increase in conversations. Again, a lot of people turned to LinkedIn. 
because they realized that was a business platform. It was still being taken seriously. But a lot of us were actually looking at our feeds where, whereby we may not have ever taken notice before. Uh, a 60% increase in content creation. Amazing for the channel, maybe not so good for the rest of us because there's an awful lot more noise out there than there used to be. So again, this is somewhere you really need to pinpoint and target your content. 437% uh, increase in live streams. I mean, need five times the increase in live streams. Uh, again, where everyone gets the time to watch this, I don't know. Um, but again, getting into exactly the right people um, and into your target audience, people are using it, it's clearly working. Uh, 15 times more content impressions. So content now has been looked at much more than job postings. It used to be more of a jobs board. Um, and ad, ad group, ad reach grew by 25 million people. It's huge. Uh, and the decision makers, four out of five people on LinkedIn are making decisions. Um, laser targeting, as I said, uh, it's very expensive on a cost per click basis, but this is more supposed to be an awareness and a conversion basis, conversion through forms, etc. And they give you the choice to decide whether you want to, to look at a, an audience for awareness, brand awareness, consideration, which is actually direct website visits, which we wouldn't recommend already con conversions, so lead generation, et cetera. And that's where we would look at it, to put content in front of people. Um, you can always also buy email, as I'm sure you all know, you've all been targeted from it as well. You can target a very, very pinpointed area. And again, as we were talking about earlier, as far as how you actually phrase it, hi, John, dear John, et cetera, you can do all of that through LinkedIn and through email as well. Um, Job titles, really think this through because you really can. You can go and do a search. You can even do it on your personal account and go. So you can really hyper-target in to say your procurement managers. Um, and so there's very little wastage on this platform. You really are putting what you want to put in front of exactly the right people. Again, you can upload your own data in here, exactly the same as those other channels. And you can use lead generation forms. That Lead generation forms that you can fill in with two clicks, even on a mobile device because you can link them into your databases and the data that LinkedIn has as well. So all I've got to do is click a couple of buttons and you're subscribing to download a white paper or whatever the content might be that's there. There's an example of how you do the targeting. I won't go through that too much with you, but it is very, very easy. And again, before you go and speak to anyone, you can do a lot of research through and see how many people and roughly how much you'd have to spend to get in front of these people very, very quickly. Finally, I've talked about paid, and this is paying for it all the way through. Lee put social media at the bottom of her list at the moment, even though people are going to be spending over 50% of their budgets on digital marketing. And I think that's because a lot of social media um, isn't paid. And so people are trying to get likes, people are trying to get follows, people are trying to get people on Twitter and Facebook and grow. We all know that's virtually impossible these days. There's just too much noise out there. LinkedIn is one of the few places that organic, non-paid activity works well. Um, it's a personal platform. You don't really interact with a company on LinkedIn. So if you've got a company profile there, you won't get many followers, you won't get many likes, you won't get many people coming into it. It is personal. And this is where you can get your teams, etc., to actually really build up their profiles take a course with someone like James Potter, who James or I could introduce you to, uh, optimize your profile, your credentials. When you listen to somebody who knows what they're doing on LinkedIn, the difference is huge. And like Christine and Lee, both huge users of LinkedIn and posting and get this right as well. You need to post daily, you respect their algorithms and work out how the al algorithms work. And most importantly on LinkedIn, you keep it human you're talking to other human beings. And we, we often forget this with uh, marketing, especially in B2B, but you are putting yourself and your message and you're just having a conversation with people. Um, mixed text, image and video uh, images do get a lot more views and a lot more interaction, but the algorithms doesn't like videos and images as much as it does text. So it might not display your content to as many people. So there are lots of ways you can look at it. Uh, commenting on potential customers' posts, making peripheral noise. It's a great tactic on LinkedIn. Go in and see what people are posting. If there's somebody you're interested in, just constantly be that person who's making a little comment on it, preferably a nice comment. Um, and gradually you're there in the peripheral vision for when you're actually needed in the future. And lastly, consider a closed group. 
uh, you can create a closed group on several of the social media channels, especially on LinkedIn. So a similar sort of group that we're talking to today, where you invite people in, only those people can come in. Because 2021, that we're in now, is supposed to be the year of community marketing. So that is building communities of like-minded people that you can then help do their job better through the content that you're bringing to them. Uh, and I think you're going to see an awful lot more of that this year. I thought it wasn't too quick for you for your stats, but that's me done. Thank you. Fantastic, John. That, that's really good. An amazing set of uh, stats and figures there. Really quite surprising. So thanks for that. And to your point about making uh, sort of your posts human, I, I do think that B2B is much more H2H nowadays. So, uh, you know, it's uh, th amazing how m more human business has become, I think, uh, during COVID, which is fantastic. So thank you all uh, for some fantastic topics and um, presentations. Uh, we now go on to the uh, panel discussion. Um, Abby's got a few questions for everybody. And uh, if there's any from the um, participants, then please put something in the Q&A, that'd be fantastic. So Abby, if you wouldn't mind uh, shouting out those uh, questions, that'd be amazing, thank you. Sure, yeah, so we've got a question here from Chris. Um, have you seen the privacy changes at Facebook making targeting HCPs harder, especially for country level specialist audiences where the total numbers are small? Sorry, is that directed at myself, Abby, I guess? Um, yes, I, yeah, probably. Um, specifically, I don't know if I can actually answer that question at the moment, because Facebook, um, you know, you've seen what um, WhatsApp have done recently, as well as far as their data and their privacy, etc. cetera, have gone. Um, I think the only answer with something like Facebook is to go in and experiment. Uh, you, you can't go too far wrong with going in and trying and seeing what audience is there and what they'll let you do. Um, it's one of those many platforms that you can put adverts up there, you can put stuff ready to go, and they'll either be approved or declined. Um, so you know, I think I'd say, James and I spoke about this yesterday, in fact, provided your compliance team are happy with what you're putting out there, then you can't hurt it to try and see whether the, the platform's how it'll get out. I think, can I, can I expand on that point, right? <clears throat> so I, I can imagine when John was presenting, there was a number of you out there just going, well, I don't see, you know, this is never going to happen. Spotify, like how the hell am I going to reach customers on Spotify? I, I was fascinated by Spotify. I've only ever seen it as a as a music provider, and then I've recently got onto podcasts on Spotify. Hadn't even considered ads because I've had premium for a long time, right? But I wanted to to like take that hat off of compliance will never let me do this. You know, our PR colleagues, and I, I think back to my radio uh, when I was in PR, we did radio days where you'd sit in a studio trying to get around all the local um, studios with some sort of key opinion leader on a disease awareness campaign for the public. I'm just thinking how much easier that would have been with targeted advertising on Spotify. So obviously the, the easy answer here is disease awareness, um, corporate PR. You know, we're in a great position at the moment as an industry. We should be making more of it. We're the heroes of the, well, we, we've shown just what we can do in terms of getting those vaccines out there. But I think it's behoving on us as content creators and including in the brand space is how can we be more creative more innovative in using these platforms. And that's why we asked John along. John is not a farmer true blood with a digital spine like I am. He's doing this for other industries. And I think it's really interesting just to see what is available. And then, you know, when you're sitting around and planning and thinking and, you know, had you ever considered Spotify, what could you do with Spotify around that, that's obviously compliant? So I, I found that really, really fascinating. Um, and to the point of, of, of reaching out on LinkedIn, you know, I don't know what the rules are around a rep reaching out to a customer, right? If they're not talking about brand, that's just the same as them calling them, right? What about a brand lead engaging with a key opinion leader on LinkedIn? I mean, that's where our customers are. That's where they network. That's where they exchange information. Is it not feasible that we could contact them there as well to engage them in activities? As long as we're not making core claims or talking about brands, I think it's a uh, you know, an underutilized, uh, whole, that whole suite's underthought through. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess we've kind of almost answered the second question then. Um, in terms of HCP campaigns, um, do people provide enough pro professional information for effective targeting on um, Spotify and Pinterest? Uh, for example, would a HCP use their professional email for these channels? Um, this makes creating a lookalike audience using CRM data hard, even if you have a list of professional email addresses. Um, 
sorry, Chris goes on to say, for these reasons and the changes to Facebook targeting driven by privacy, I wonder if LinkedIn is the only viable platform for accurate in-country targeting of specialist HCPs, or have you seen success with HCPs specifically on other channels you mentioned? Yeah, can I revert back? Uh, can, I, can I translate? Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I translate, I know what Chris is getting at, right? So we, we need to... Um, when you think about HCP targeting, it's really key, and, and we spend a lot of time and effort thinking about customer segmentation. It, even, even okay, let's the simplest segmentation. If I'm not interested in neurologists, I, I you know, wh why waste my effort on neurologists? My, I have a product in cardiology, right? And it's unlikely that in the Spotify, uh, Pinterest zone, that's something that the HCP has put on their profile. And that's where I think, you know, disease awareness, patient awareness campaigns, those platforms are. Uh, huge opportunities for that side of things, as well as corporate PR. But when it comes to um, the more brand-related um, promotional active or non-promotional activities, disease awareness, but specific to one, but looking to get to HCPs, kind of with Chris there, that, that, that Chris works at a platform called MedShare. You know, that's a closed community of clinicians. It gives a lot more freedom. They'll have profiles and the same with doctors.net. You know, th those are the, the closed environments where we can... We can uh, find the doctors in the wild, but they're all doctors or clinicians. Um, and LinkedIn would provide the degree of that, I think. I don't, don't know quite how special, how many options there are to set up your profile. So I think Chris has rightly maybe identified the split here, which is, you know, what do we know enough about the customer base to make it targeted for HCPs on those other platforms versus LinkedIn, MedShare, Doctors.net and things like that. Yeah. I don't know if that's what you're getting. No, I agree. I think one thing to add on top of that is is don't just take the targeting, the uploading of your data, etc., to apply to absolutely everything. Because I agree, a lot of people will be using personal email addresses, etc. But think about the channel and the number of people that are actually on that channel. So let's take Spotify, podcasts. We all started listening to podcasts a lot more last year. The growth of podcasts was huge. Spotify have invested a huge amount of money in some of the top podcasters and bought the rights to them. So they are they're going to move Spotify more into a podcasting channel. You'll see more podcasts than you will music work. And a lot of those podcasts are very specific to your target market. So this is a little bit hard work that's going on and finding a podcast that people who you are interested in will be listening to. And you can even approach the people that actually run the podcast and place adverts within the podcast, which is pretty granular, uh, but actually it's very cheap and incredibly powerful. Um, so it is it's just the awareness of where your audience is at, that they're not just searching, searching on Google, they're, they're all over the place. So there you go, just an example, I've just done a quick search for neurology podcasts on Spotify, and there's the American Academy of Neurology Journals, like oh, that was a really quick look, right? But yeah, so th there's there's some sort of base targeting you could you could do with that that might be might be interesting, especially if you were looking to recruit neurologists to your own webinar or, or podcast, then you know, that, there is a an element of that i think the um the the more refined thing uh, chris has just said sorry sorry i was not not being difficult yes you were <laughs> no i'm kidding uh not being difficult really interested in targeting hcps as we acquire twenty five thousand hcps per month as members via advertising on some of these channels yeah so there you go so so it is it's it's that that how granular can you get uh, in that targeting, but yeah, maybe the podcast you're listening to, super, uh, super effective for disease awareness and all that kind of stuff. But maybe also, you know, pulling, as Chris says, pulling your customers in who have an interest in neurology and are clinicians. Yeah, and Chris, get in touch because I'd, I'd love to explore that more. Uh, get some of the team to go and talk to. We've got reps on all of the channels as well, so it'd be really interesting actually to try and get them to answer some of your questions too. Um, I just had um, Paul, uh, well, I noticed we answered a question and Lee answered a question with Paul Hackett and if Paul's still on the call. Um, but I found that quite interesting about, um, Paul was asking whether there's the ability to Spotify or, or, or other things to have closed podcasts. So I know that on Apple and other um, Luminary and things like that, there's a premium. So I'm a Sam Harris premium user, which means I get an extended version of his podcast. But I have to I have to register on his site, and then that releases a new podcast on Apple, yeah. mute on Apple Podcasts. Is there something similar on Spotify? I mean, in theory, if we had a podcast for clinicians only, can you lock it down on Spotify like that? 
you can't at the moment, no. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that's what's coming next because podcasts, if you think Spotify, you know, it started as a music channel. Um, podcast is something that they saw exploding, so they've really grabbed. So I, I imagine that will that will happen next. But there are obviously plenty of other ways of creating podcasts that you can then, you know, have as you've got in a close group. Cool. Um, yeah, Paul's got his hand up um, uh, on, on the thing. I don't know whether Paul, you want to submit another question around that. Um, what, while you do, I had, um, so when we talk a lot about data and what we use it for, whether it's targeting and, and all the rest of it, or whether it's, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, what, what the doctors are seeing, using, opening, clicking through, all the rest of it. And Lee touched on the thing, and this is really important, which is it, is, it can feel a little creepy. You know, it can feel like, should we be looking at this? How does the rep deal with the fact that they know if a doctor's opened an email, should they cover that up or should they be open about it? What level of sort of knowledge should we have? And I, I thought about my experience just um, on Friday. Um, I'm an Apple fanboy, right? And I've got the old AirPod Pros, but it's had this problem in it. I've had it replaced three times. And even with Apple, you know, sorry, yeah, with Apple, when you call them up, they've got all your notes. It's joined up, it's a joined up experience, right? So they know what problems I've had before. They know everything about me. And that is that creepy? No, it makes my life really easy when I have to complain again, despite you know having an issue. Whereas with TalkTalk, Talk, um, when TalkTalk Talk dropped our, our, our internet this, at the beginning of this month, uh, it, I had to explain it to about five different people in, in five different calls. And uh, it's just, you know, maybe we should be viewing the fact that the data is not just good for us in terms of insights into our customers, but it's good to good that joined up um, experience that Lee touched on, which is you know, it's that personalized joined up sequential um, experience that our customers be looking for. Mm. Don't you comment on that, Lee. At all. Uh, well, just one question from us as well is um, if you guys, if the, the three speakers could have one takeaway for the participants um, from what they've sort of shared with us, what, what would that be? Maybe start with Lee. Lee, can you hear us? Oh, we can't, you're on mute. Sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One key takeaway. Um, I don't know. How do you boil it all down? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's very much about um, how do you actually understand where your customer is at, both not just in sort of their world of work, but how the whole their whole behaviors are changing. So I think for us to really make an impact um, and sort of, you know, make the, the most of the opportunity of this halo effect of you know what we can do in pharma, not just because you know we're doing great things with the with the vaccine, but just because um, you know there's this opportunity to really make a, a fundamental change across the board. We need to be understanding at a basic level you know, where our customers are coming from. So it's all about insights and discovery and going back and saying, how is the world different for you now? You know, how are, you know, how are your um, exchanges with your um, patients being um, impacted? And, um, you know, what are outcomes now looking like compared to what they did this time last year? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how can we as an industry support you in, you know, improving that and making it better? Because, you know, we've got, a whole swathe of customers who are going to have to do things very, very differently. And they're going to need these sort of creative solutions. And I think it's a massive opportunity for us as an industry um, to go in and really make a change and help them do that. And, you know, it will make those relationships, you know, last into the future. And that's how we're going to keep building that trust to, you know, change the image of the industry and, you know, move it all forward. So, sorry, I had to dig deep there because there was just too many things. But yeah, yeah that, fair enough. No, that was great. Thanks, Lee. That's brilliant. What about you, John? I would simply say, don't be afraid to experiment. Don't overthink this stuff. You know, you've got your content. Compliance have signed it off. We know where the audiences are, uh, and it's thinking maybe slightly outside the box as to exactly you know who, who those people are, what their interests are. But just experiment. It, it really it can't go wrong. I know mm. I'm shot for saying that, but you can try stuff. If you think years ago. We used to send out, you know, the mail merge with your carbon copy paper, James. You know, we'd, we'd have to send out a thousand letters. You'd have to wait a week to see if somebody came back to you. You'd then make your phone call and then you'd do the next batch. This you can do in 30 seconds. You can put your advert live. 
you can try if it's going wrong turn it off so yeah don't be afraid yeah it's pretty immediate thanks john that's great what about you james um half stealing leads which is instead of putting obviously we put the, the customer in the center of what we do but for me it's putting the rep at the center and thinking about you know um the stuff that we produce for them to use how they feel using it um but ultimately for me it's about uh, the customer journeys at a, at a, at a um an understanding how a rep can help them through that customer journey with the right content at the right time Brilliant. and in the crm <laughs> 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 of course always a crm yeah brilliant were there any more questions or should no nope, i think that's yeah? it yeah cool well that's been fantastic guys thank you so much and uh, uh this will this recording will be on our youtube channel which i think the link of which abby's shared on the chat um so do check it out in uh, a few days uh, we should have it up there nicely edited up um and uh yeah um look forward to seeing and hearing you all again can we do a brief plug for the 25th of February, which may well be, it looks like we're shaping up for the next one of these, where we'll be looking at alternative conferencing, um, you know, how to do conferencing online, rather IRL, got some interesting speakers potentially lined up. Um, we're having a meeting on Monday with them to see how that goes, but um, we'll, we'll send out invitations and do the usual sort of splurge on, on, on the, the social, but just wanted to say thank you so much to Lee and John and to Christine uh, and Abby um, for, for, for getting this meeting going and such great presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys.